Doolittle Raid from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. The Doolittle Raid, also known as the Tokyo Raid, on Saturday, April 18th, 1942, was an air raid by the United States of America on the Japanese capital Tokyo and other places on the island of Honshu during World War II, the first air raid to strike the Japanese home islands. It demonstrated that Japan itself was vulnerable to American air attack, served as retaliation for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on Sunday, December 7, 1941, and provided an important boost to American morale. The raid was planned and led by Lieutenant Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle, United States Army Air Forces. 16 U.S. Army Air Force's B-25B Mitchell bombers, medium bombers, were launched beyond fighter escort range from the U.S. Navy's aircraft carrier, USS Hornet, deep in the western Pacific Ocean, each with a crew of five men. The plan called for them to bomb military targets in Japan, and to continue westward to land in China. Landing a medium bomber on Hornet was impossible. Fifteen aircraft reached China, but all later crashed, while the 16th landed at Vladivostok in the Soviet Union. All but three of the 80 crew members initially survived the mission. Eight soldiers were captured by the Japanese army in China. Three of those were later executed. The B-25 that landed in the Soviet Union was confiscated, and its crew interned for more than a year. Fourteen complete crews, except for one crewman who was killed in action, returned either to the United States or to American forces. After the raid, the Japanese Imperial Army conducted a massive sweep through the eastern coastal provinces of China in an operation now known as the Zhejiang Jiangxi Campaign, searching for the surviving American airmen and inflicting retribution on the Chinese who aided them in an effort to prevent this part of China from being used again for an attack on Japan. The raid, the raid caused negli negligible material damage to Japan, but it achieved its goal of raising American morale and casting doubt in Japan on the ability of its military leaders to defend their home islands. It also contributed to Admiral Isoroko Yamamoto's decision to attack Midway Island in the Central Pacific an attack that turned into a decisive strategic defeat of the Imperial Japanese Navy by the U.S. Navy in the Battle of Midway. Doolittle, who initially believed that the loss of his, all his aircraft would lead to his court-martial, received the Medal of Honor and was promoted two steps to Brigadier General. Section 1. Origins The raid had its start in a desire by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, expressed to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in a meeting at the White House on the 21st of December, 1941, that Japan be bombed as soon as possible to boost public morale after the disaster at Pearl Harbor. Doolittle later recounted in his autobiography that the raid was intended to bolster American morale and to cause the Japanese to begin doubting their leadership, in which it succeeded. Quote, the Japanese people had been told they were invulnerable. An attack on the Japanese homeland would cause confusion in the minds of the Japanese people and sow doubt about the reliability of their leaders. There was a second and equally important psychological reason for this attack. Americans badly needed a morale boost. End quote. The concept for the attack came from Navy Captain Francis Lowe, Assistant Chief of Staff for Anti-Submarine Warfare, who reported to Admiral Ernest J. King on the 10th of January, 1942, that he thought twin-engine army bombers could be launched from an aircraft carrier after observing several at a naval airfield in Norfolk, Virginia, where the runway was painted with the outline of a carrier deck for launching practice. The attack was planned and led by Doolittle, a famous military test pilot, civilian aviator, and aeronautical engineer before the war. Requirements that the aircraft have a cruising range of 2,400 nautical miles, 4,400 kilometers, with a 2,000 pound, 910 kg, bomb load, resulted in the selection of the B-25B Mitchell to carry out the mission. The range of the Mitchell at the time was only about 1,300 miles, 
so the bombers had to be heavily modified to hold nearly twice the normal fuel reserves. The Martin B-26 Marauder, Douglas B-18 Bolo, and Douglas B-23 Dragon were also considered, but the B-26 had questionable takeoff characteristics from a carrier deck, and the B-23's wingspan was nearly 50% greater than the B-25's, reducing the number that could be taken aboard a carrier and posing risks to the ship's island superstructure. The B-18, one of the final two types considered by Doodle, was rejected for the same reason. The B-25 had yet to be tested in combat, but subsequent tests with B-25s indicated they could fulfill the mission's requirements. Doolittle's first report on the plan suggested the bombers might land in Vladivostok, shortening the flight by 600 nautical miles 1, kilometers, on the basis of turning over the B-25s at lend -le as Lend-Lease. Negotiations with the Soviet Union for permission, which had signed a neutrality pact with Japan in April 1941, were fruitless. Bombers attacking defended targets often relied on a fighter escort to defend them from enemy fighters. Not only did Doolittle's aircraft lack a full complement of guns to save weight, but it was not possible for fighters to accompany them. Section 2. Preparation When planning indicated that the B-25 was the aircraft best meeting all specifications of the mission, two were loaded aboard the aircraft carrier USS Hornet at Norfolk, Virginia, and subsequently flown off the deck without difficulty on the 3rd of February 1942. The raid was immediately approved, and the 17th Bomb Group, medium, was chosen to provide the pool of crews from which volunteers would be recruited. The 17th BG had been the first group to receive B-25s, with all four of its squadrons equipped with the bomber by September 1941. The 17th not only was the first medium bomb group of the Army Air Corps, but in the spring of 1942 also had the most experienced B-25 crews. Its first assignment, following the entry of the United States into the war, was to the U.S. 8 Air Force. The 17th BG, then flying anti-submarine patrols from Pendleton, Oregon, was immediately moved cross-country to Lexington County Army Air Base at Columbia, South Carolina, ostensibly to fly similar patrols off the east coast of the United States, but in actuality to prepare for the mission against Japan. The group officially transferred effective 9th of February to Columbia, where its combat crews were offered the opportunity to volunteer for an extremely hazardous but unspecified mission. On the 17th of February, the group was detached from the 8th Air Force. Initial planning called for 20 aircraft to fly the mission, and 24 of the group's B-25B Mitchell bombers were diverted to the Mid-Continent Airlines Modification Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. With support provided by two senior airline managers, Old Chamberlain Fields Maintenance Hangar was the first modification center to become operational. From nearby Fort Snelling, the 710th Military Police Battalion provided tight security around this hangar. Modifications included removal of the lower gun turret, installation of de-icers and anti-icers, steel blast plates mounted on the fuselage around the upper turret, removal of the liaison radio set, a weight impediment, installation of a 160-gallon collapsible neoprene auxiliary fuel tank fixed to the top of the bomb bay, and support mounts for additional fuel cells in the bomb bay, crawlaway, and lower tur turret area to increase fuel capacity from 646 to 1,141 U.S. gallons, mock gun barrels installed in the tail cone, and replacement of their Norden bomb site with a makeshifting aiming site devised by pilot, Captain Charles Ross Greening, and called the Mark Twain. The materials for the bomb site cost only 20 cents. Two bombers also had cameras mounted to record the results of the bombing. The 24 crews selected picked up the modified bombers in Minneapolis and flew them to Eglin Field, Florida, beginning the 1st of March 1942. There the crews received concentrated training for three weeks in simulated carrier deck takeoffs, low-level and night flying, 
low-attitude bombing, and over-water navigation, primarily out of Wagner Field, Auxiliary Field 1. Lieutenant Henry Miller, USN, from nearby Navy Air Station Pensacola, supervised their takeoff training and accompanied the crews to the launch. For his efforts, Miller is considered an honorary member of the Raider Group. Doolittle started in his after-action report, stated in his after-action report that the crews reached a safely operational level of training, despite several days when flying was not possible because of rain and fog. One aircraft was heavily damaged in a takeoff incident, and then another removed from the mission because of nose wheel shimmy, a nose wheel shimmy that could not be replaced, repaired in time. On the 25th of March, 1942, the remaining 22 B-25s took off from Elgin for McCle McClellan Field, California. They arrived two days later at the Sacramento Air Depot, Depot for final modifications. A total of 16 B-25s were subsequently flown to NAS Alameda, California, on the 31st of March. Fifteen made up the mission force, and the 16th, by last-minute agreement with the Navy, was squeezed onto the deck to be flown off shortly after departure from San Francisco to provide feedback to the Army pilots about takeoff characteristics. Instead, that bomber was made part of the mission force. Section 3. Mission On the 1st of April, 1942, the 16 modified bombers, their five-man crews, and Army maintenance personnel totaling 71 officers and 130 enlisted men were loaded onto the USS Hornet at Naval Air Station Alameda. Each aircraft carried four specifically constructed 500-pound, 225-kg bombs. Three of these were high-explosive munitions, and one was a bundle of incendiaries. incendiaries. The incendiaries were long tubes wrapped together in order to be carried in the bomb bay, but designed to separate and scatter over a wide area after release. Five bombs had Japanese friendship medals wired to them. Medals were awarded by the Japanese government to U.S. servicemen before the war. The bomber's armament was reduced to increase range by decreasing weight. Each bomber launched with two half-inch caliber, 12.7mm machine guns in an upper turret and a .30 caliber, 7.62mm machine gun in the nose. The aircraft were clustered closely and tied down on Hornet's flight deck in order of launch, in the order of launch. Hornet and Task Force 18 left the port of Alameda at 10 a.m. on the 2nd of April, and a few days later rendezvoused with Task Force 16, commanded by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr., the carrier USS Enterprise, and her escort of cruisers and destroyers in the mid-Pacific Ocean, north of Hawaii. Enterprise's fighters and scout planes provided protection for the entire task force in the event of a Japanese air attack, since Hornet's fighters were stowed below decks to allow the B-25s to use the flight deck. The combined force was two carriers, three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, eight destroyers, and two fleet oilers. The escort ships, Salt Lake City, Northampton, Vincennes, Nashville, Balch, Fanning, Benham, Ellet, Gwyn, Meredith, Grayson, Monson, Samaron, and Sabine, then proceeded in radio silence. On the afternoon of the 17th of April, the slow oilers refueled the task force, then withdrew with the destroyers to the east, while the carriers and cruisers dashed west at 20 knots, 37 kilometers per hour, 23 miles per hour toward their intended launch point in enemy-controlled waters east of Japan. At 7.38 a.m. on the morning of the 18th of April, while the task force was still about 650 nautical miles, 1,200 kilometers, 750 miles, from Japan, at it was sighted by the Japanese picket boat number 23, Nitumaru, a 70-ton patrol craft, which radioed an attack, warning to Japan. The boat was sunk by gunfire from USS Nashville. The chief petty officer who captained the boat committed suicide rather than be captured, but five of the eleven crew were picked up by Nashville. Doolittle and Hornet skipper Captain Mark Mitcher 
decided to launch the B-25s immediately, 10 hours early and 170 nautical miles farther from Japan than planned. After respotting to, after respotting to allow for engine start and run-ups, Doolittle's aircraft had 467 feet of takeoff distance. Although none of the B-25 pilots, including Doolittle, had ever taken off from a carrier before, all 16 aircraft launched safely between 8.20 a.m. and 9.19 a.m. The 16th B-25 had been included only as a reserve, intended to fly along as an observation and photographic platform, but when surprise was compromised, Doolittle decided to use all 16 aircraft in the attack. The B-25s then flew toward Japan, most in groups of two to four aircraft, before flying single file at wave top level to avoid detection. The aircraft began arriving over Japan about noon Tokyo time, six hours after launch, and bombed ten military and industrial targets in Tokyo, two in Yokohama, and one each in Yokozuka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka. Although some B-25s encountered light, light anti-aircraft fire and a few enemy fighters over Japan, no bomber was shot down. Only the B-25 of Lieutenant Richard O. Joyce received any battle damage, minor hits from anti-aircraft fire. B-25 No. 4, piloted by Lieutenant Everett W. Holstrom, jettisoned its bombs before reaching its target when it came under attack by fighters after its gun turret malfunctioned. At least one Japanese fighter was shot down by the gunners of the Whirling Dervish, piloted by Lieutenant Harold Watson. Two other fighters were shot down by the gunners of the ha Harai Car Carrière, piloted by Ross Greening. Many military targets were strafed by the bomber's nose gunners. The subterfuge of the simulated gun barrels mounted in the tail cones was described afterwards by Doolittle as effective, in that no airplane was attacked from directly behind. Fifteen of the sixteen aircraft then proceeded southwest along the southern coast of Japan and across the East China Sea towards eastern China, where several fields in Zhejiang province were supposed to be ready to guide them in using homing beacons, then recover and refuel them for continuing on to Chongqing. The wartime Kuomintang capital. The primary base at Zhuzhou, toward which all the aircraft navigated, but Halsey never sent the planned signal to alert them, apparently because of a possible threat to the task force. One B-25, piloted by Captain Edward J. York, was extremely low on fuel and headed instead for the closer Soviet Union. The raiders faced several unforeseen challenges during their flight to China. Night was approaching, the aircraft were running low on fuel, and the weather was rapidly deteriorating. None would have reached China if not for a tail tailwind as they came off the target, which increased their ground speed by 25 knots for seven hours. The crews realized they would probably not be able to reach their intended bases in China, leaving them the option of either bailing out over eastern China or crash landing along the Chinese coast. Fifteen aircraft reached the Chinese coast after 13 hours of flight and crash landed where the crews bailed out. The crew who flew to the Soviet Union landed 40 miles beyond Vladivostok, where their B-25 was confiscated and the crew interned. It was the longest combat mission ever flown by the B-25 Mitchell medium bomber, averaging approximately 2,250 nautical miles. Although York and his crew were well treated, diplomatic attempts to return them to the United States ultimately failed. Eventually, they were relocated to Ashgabat, 20 miles from the Iranian border, and York managed to bribe a smuggler who helped them cross the border and reach a nearby British consulate on the 11th of May 1943. The smuggling was actually staged by the NKVD, according to declassified Soviet archives, because the Soviet government was unable to repatriate them legally in the face of the neutrality pact with Japan. Doolittle and his crew, after parachuting into China, received assistance from Chinese soldiers and civilians, as well as John Birch, an American missionary in China. As did the others who participated in the mission, Doolittle had to bail out, but fortunately he landed in a heap of dung, saving a previously injured ankle from breaking. 
in a paddy in China near Chuzhou. Doolittle felt the raid had been a terrible failure because all the aircraft were lost, and he expected to be court-martialed on his return. He subsequently recommended Birch for intelligence work with Clear Channel's Flying Tigers. One crewman, Corporal Leland T. Factor, flight engineer, gunner, with Gray, was killed during his bailout attempt over China, the only man in that crew to be lost. Two crews, ten men, were missing. Section 4. Aftermath Following the Doolittle raid, most of the B-25 crews who had reached China eventually achieved safety with the help of Chinese civilians and soldiers. Of the 16 planes and 80 airmen who participated in the raid, with the single exception of Captain Edward York and his crew, which landed in Soviet Russia, and the crew interned. All either crash-landed, were ditched, or crashed after their crews bailed out. Nevertheless, 69 escaped capture or death, with only three killed in action, as a result of the loss of their aircraft. When the Chinese helped the Americans escape, the grateful Americans in turn gave them whatever they had on hand. The people who helped them paid dearly for sheltering the Americans. Eight raiders were captured, but their fate was not fully known until 1946. Accounted for as KIA shortly after the raid was Corporal Leland D. Factor, the flight engineer slash gunner of Lieutenant Robert M. Gray's crew. The citation for his posthumous Distinguished Flying Cross reported that after Factor successfully bailed out with the rest of his crew over mountainous terrain near Suichang, Zhejiang Province, China, he was killed shortly afterwards when he fell down a cliff. The crews of two aircraft, ten men in total, were accounted for. Hallmark's crew, sixth off, and Faro's crew, last off. On the 15th of August, 1942, the United States learned from the Swiss Consulate General in Shanghai that eight of the missing crew members were prisoners of the Japanese at the city's police headquarters. Two crewmen drowned after crash landing in the ocean. On the 19th of October, 1942, the Japanese announced that they had tried the eight prisoners and sentenced them all to death, but said several had received commutation of their sentences to life imprisonment. No names or details were given. The story of the missing crews was revealed in February 1946 during a war crimes trial held in Shanghai to try four Japanese officers charged with mis mistreating the eight captured crewmen. It was learned that two of the missing crewmen, Staff Sergeant William J. Dieter and Sergeant Don Donald E. Fitzmaurice, drowned when their B-25 crashed into the sea. The other eight were captured. Lieutenants De Dean E. Hallmark, Robert J. Mader, Chase Nielsen, William G. Far Farrow, Robert L. Height, and George Barr, and Corporals Harold A. Spatz and Jacob DeShazer. On the 28th of August, 1942, Pilot Hallmark, Pilot Farrow, and Gunner Spatz faced a war crimes trial by the Japanese court alleging they strafed and murdered Japanese civilians. At 4.30 p.m. on the 15th of October, 1942, they were taken by truck to Public Cemetery No. 1 and executed by firing squad. The other captured airmen remained in military confinement on a starvation diet, their health rapidly deteriorating. In April 1943, they were moved to Nanking, where Mader died on the 1st of December 1943. The remaining men, Nielsen, Height, Barr, and De Shazer, eventually began receiving slightly better treatment and were given a copy of the Bible and a few other books. They were freed by American troops in August 1945. Four Japanese officers were tried for war crimes against the captured Doolittle Raiders, found guilty, and sentenced to hard labor, three for five years and one for nine years. De Shazer graduated from Seattle Pacific University in 1948 and returned to, to, to Japan as a missionary, where he served for over 30 years. Total crew casualties. Three KIA, two off the coast of China, one in China, eight prisoners of war, three executed, one died in captivity, four repatriated. 
of the surviving prisoners, Barr died of heart failure in 1967. Nielsen in 2007, DeShazer on 15th March 2008, and the last, Height, died 29th of March 2015. Service of the recruiting re returning air crewmen. Immediately following the raid, Doolittle told his crew that he believed the loss of all 16 aircraft coupled with the relatively minor damage to targets had rendered the attack a failure and that he expected a court-martial upon his return to the United States. Instead, the raid bolsters American morale to such an extent that Doolittle was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Roosevelt and was promoted two grades to Brigadier General, skipping the rank of Colonel. When General Doolittle toured the growing Eglin Field facility in July 1942 with Commanding Officer Colonel Grandison Gardner, the local paper of record, the Okaloosa News Journal, Crestview, Florida, while reporting his presence, made no mention of his still secret for Kent training at Eglin. Recent training at Eglin. He went on to command the 12th Air Force in North Africa, the 15th Air Force in the Mediterranean, and the 8th Air Force in England during the next three years. Corporal David J. Thatcher, a flight engineer slash gunner on Lawson's crew, and First Lieutenant Thomas R. White, flight surgeon slash gunner with Smith, each received a silver star for helping the wounded crew members of Lieutenant Lawson's crew to evade Japanese troops in China. All 80 raiders were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, and those who were killed or wounded during the raid awarded the Purple Heart. Every Doolittle raider was also decorated by the Chinese government. 28 of the crewmen remained in the China-Burma-India theater, flying missions, most for more than a year. Five were killed in action. Nineteen crew members flew combat missions from North Africa after returning to the United States, four of whom were killed in action, and four becoming prisoners of war. Nine crew members served in the European theater of operations. One was killed in action. Altogether, twelve of the survivors died in air crashes within fifteen months of their raid. Two survivors were separated from the USAAF in 1944, due to the severity of their injuries. The 17th Bomb Group, from which the Doolittle Raiders had been recruited, received replacement crews and transferred to Barksdale Army Airfield in June 1942, where it converted to Martin B-26 Marauder medium bombers. In November 1942, it deployed overseas to North Africa, where it operated in the Mediterranean Theater of Operations with the 12th Air Force for the remainder of the war. After the raid, the Japanese Imperial Army began the Zhejiang Jiangxi Campaign, also known as Operation Seigo, in order to prevent these eastern coastal provinces of China from being used again for an attack on Japan. All airfields within a range of some 20,000 square miles in the areas where the raiders had landed were torn up. Germ warfare was used and atrocities committed, and those found with American items were shot. The Japanese killed an estimated 10,000 Chinese civilians during their search for Doolittle's men. Some estimates are that as many as 250,000 Chinese were killed during the campaign. Section 5. Impact. Compared with the future devastating Boeing B-29 Superfortress attacks against Japan, the Doolittle raid did little material damage, and all of it was easily repaired. Eight primary and five secondary targets were struck. In Tokyo, the targets included an oil tank farm, a steel mill, and several power plants. In Yokozuka, at least one bomb from the B-25, piloted by Lieutenant Edgar E. McElroy, struck the nearly completed light carrier Ryuho, delaying her launch until November. Six schools and an army hospital were also hit. Japanese officials reported the two aircraft whose crews were captured had struck their targets. Despite the minimal damage inflicted, American morale, still reeling from the attack on Pearl Harbor and Japan's subs subsequent territorial gains, soared when news of the raid was released. The Japanese press was told to describe the attack as a cruel, indiscriminate bombing against civilians, women and children. For years before per Pearl Harbor, there had been mock air raid drills in every Japanese city, although China's air force was almost non-existent. This may have been part of the process of keeping warlike emotion at a high pitch. The Japanese Navy attempted to locate and pursue the American task force. 
The second fleet, its main striking force, was near Taiwan, returning from the Indian Ocean raid to refit and replace its air losses. Spearheaded by five aircraft carriers and its best naval aircraft and air crews, the second fleet was immediately ordered to locate and destroy the US carrier force, but failed to do so. The Imperial Japanese Navy also bore a special responsibility for allowing an Ameri American aircraft carrier force to approach the Japanese home islands in a manner similar to the IGN fle fleet to Hawaii in 1941, and permitting it to escape undamaged. The fact that medium, normally land-based bombers carried out the attack confused the IJN's high command. This confusion and the knowledge that Japan was now vulnerable to air attack strengthened Yamamoto's resolve to capture Midway Island, resulting in a decisive Japanese defeat at the Battle of Midway. Quote, it was hoped that the damage done would be both material and psychological. Material damage was to be the destruction of specific targets with ensuing confusion and retardation of produ production. The psychological results, it was hoped, would be the recalling of combat equipment from other theatres for home defence, thus affecting relief in those theatres. The development of a fear complex in Japan, improved relationships with our allies, and a favourable reaction on the American people." End quote. General James H. Doolittle, 9th of July, 1942. Section 6. Post-War. The Doolittle Raiders held an annual reunion almost every year from the late 1940s to 2013. The high point of each reunion was a solemn, private ceremony in which the surviving raiders performed a roll call, then toasted their fellow raiders who had died during the previous year. Specially engraved silver goblets, for one for each of the 80 raiders, were used for this toast. The goblets of those who have died were inverted. Each raider's name was engraved on his goblet, both right side up and upside down. The raiders drank a toast using a bottle of cognac that accompanied the goblets to each raider reunion. In 2013, the remaining raiders decided to hold their last public reunion at Fort Walton Beach, Florida, not far from Elgin Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, where they trained for the original mission. The bottle and the goblets had been maintained by the United States Air Force Academy on display in Arnold Hall, the Cadet Social Center, until 2006. On the 19th of April, 2006, these memorabilia were transferred to the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson AFB, Ohio. On the 18th of April, 2013, a final reunion for the surviving Raiders, Raiders was held at Eglin Air Force Base, with Robert Hyde, the only survivor unable to attend. The final toast to fallen comrades by the surviving Raiders took place at the NMUSAF on the 9th of November, 2013, preceded by a B-25 flyover, and was attended by Richard Cole, Edward Saylor, and David Thatcher. Section 6.1 Surviving Airmen Number 1. Colonel Richard E. Cole co-pilot of aircraft number one, age 100. Seven other men, including Lieutenant Miller and Raider historian Colonel Carol V. Glines, are considered honorary Raiders for their efforts for the mission. Colonel Bill Bauer, the last surviving Doolittle Raider full pilot, died on the 10th of January 2011 at age 93 in Boulder, Colorado. Lieutenant Colonel Edward Saylor, the then enlisted engineer slash gunner of aircraft number 15 during the raid, died on Wednesday, 28th of January, 2015, of natural causes at his home in, sum in Summer, Washington. Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Hyde, co-pilot of the plane piloted by Lieutenant William G. Farrow, died in a nursing home at the age of 95 on the 29th of March, 2015. Staff Sergeant David J. Thatcher, gunner of aircraft number 7, died on the 22nd of June, 2016. Colonel Richard Cole is the last surviving Doolittle Raider. Section 7. Commemoration. The United States Navy named the aircraft carrier USS Shangri-La after the fictional place as a reference to the Doolittle Raid. President Roosevelt had answered a reporter's question by saying that the raid 
had come from Shangri-La, which was the name of the mysterious place of perpetual youth in the Himalayas in the popular book and movie of the time, Lost Horizon. Section 7.1. Do Little Raiders Exhibit. The most extensive display of Do Little Raid memorabilia is the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. The centerpiece is a is a like new B-25, which is painted and masked as Doolittle's aircraft, 40-2344. The bomber, which North American Aviation presented to the Raiders in 1958, rests on a reproduction of Hornet's flight deck. Several authentically dressed mannequins surround the aircraft, including representations of Doolittle, Hornet Captain Mark Mitcher, and groups of Army and Navy men loading the bomber's bombs and ammunition. Also exhibited are the silver goblets used by the Raiders at each of their annual reunions, pieces of flight clothing and personal equipment, a parachute used by one of the Raiders in his bailout over China, and group photographs of all 16 crews and other items. A fragment of the wreckage of one of the aircraft and the medals awarded to Doolittle are on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. The last B-25 to be retired from the U.S. Air Force inventory is displayed at the Air Force Armament Museum at Eglin Air Force Base in the markings of General Doolittle's aircraft. The 2006 Pacific Aviation Museum Pearl Harbor on Ford Island, Oahu, Hawaii, also has a 1942 exhibit in which the centerpiece is a restored B-25 in the markings of the ruptured deck used on the Doolittle Raid. The San Marcos, Texas chapter of the Commemorative Air Force has in its museum the armor plate from the pilot seat of the B-25, Doolittle flew in the raid. Section 7.2, Doolittle Raiders Reenactment. On the 21st of April, 1992, in harmony with other World War II 50th anniversary commemorations, 1992-1995, USS Ranger participated in the commemorative reenactment of the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo, Japan, with 1,500 guests, including several raiders and VIP military veterans. Four World War II-era B-25 bombers were craned on board at Naval Air Station North Island, San Diego, California, and took off under their own power, Five miles off Point Loma, Bradley Gross, event producer, proposed the reenactment idea to General Jimmy Doolittle in 1989 and was referred to General Knobloch of the Doolittle Raiders Association. With help from Vice Admiral William Hauser, who was a member of Task Force 16, Pentagon, Pentagon wheels began turning. General Mick Kicklider was head of Department of Defense World War II 50th Anniversary Commemorative committees also got behind the idea of a reenactment. In January 1992, Gross received word that the reenactment concept was approved by DOD. The assignment was turned over to Naval Air Force U.S. Pacific Fleet, NAS, North Island in San Diego. Pentagon JAG flew out to NAS, North Island, where the runaways were marked off in increments of 500 feet. Four World War II North American B-25 bombers had to prove they could take off in under 500 feet. The B-25s were Heavenly Body, In the Mood, Pacific Princess, and the Executive Suite. Of the four B-25s, Heavenly Body and In the Mood were, were selected to be craned on board Ranger, Dockside. The Navy and civilian team had three months to organize the event, about the same amount of time as the original raid. Section 7.3 On the 19th of May, 2014, the United States House of Representatives voted to pass H.R. 1209, a bill that would award the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders a Congressional Gold Medal for outstanding heroism, valor, skill, and service to the United States in conducting the bombings of Tokyo. The award ceremony took place at the Capitol Building on, on the 15th of April, 2015, with retired Air Force Lieutenant General John Hudson, the director of the National Museum of the Air Force, accepting the reward on behalf of the Doolittle Raiders. Section 8. Popular Culture. Section 8.1. Books. Many books have been written about the Doolittle Raid. Number 1. Doolittle's Tokyo Raiders, 
by C.V. Glins tells a complete story of the raid, including the unique experience of each B-25 crew. Number two, Guests of the Kremlin by co-pilot Bob Emmons describes his crew's adventures as internees in the Soviet Union after their landing in that country following the raid. Number three, Four Came Home, also by C.V. Glines, tells the story of Nielsen, Haidt, Barr, and Deshazer, Deshazer, the raiders who were held in POW camps for more than three years. Number four, The First Heroes by Craig Nelson, goes into great details of the events leading up to the raid and the aftermath for all the pilots and their families. Number five, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo by Captain Ted W. Lawson, a pilot who participated in the raid, focuses on the experience of, uh, experiences of himself and his crew. It describes the training, the mission, his plane's crash just off the coast of China, the help he and his crew received from the Chinese in making their escape from Japanese-held ter territory, and the eventual loss of his leg, injured in the crash and amputated by the mission's flight surgeon. A popular film based on the book was released in 1944. Number six, Target Tokyo, Jimmy Doolittle, and the Raid That Avenged Pearl Harbor by James M. Scott, 2015. Based on scores of never before published records drawn from archives across four continents, as well as new interviews with survivors. Section 8.1, 8.2, films. The raid inspired several films. The 1943 RKO film, Bombardier, starred Randolph Scott and Pat O'Brien. The climax of this movie is Attack on Japan by a group of B-17s. A highly fictionalized film in 1943, Destination Tokyo, starring Cary Grant, tangentially involved the raid, concentrating on the fictional submarine USS Copperfin. The submarine's mission is to enter Tokyo Bay undetected and place a landing party ashore to obtain weather information vital to the upcoming Doolittle Raid. The film suggests the raid did not launch until up to the minute data was received. All the after-action reports indicated the raid launched without time for weather briefings because of the encounter with the picket ships. The Doolittle Raid was the subject of the 1944 feature film, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, based on a book of the same title, by Doolittle Raider pilot, Captain Ted W. Lawson, who was seriously injured in a crash landing off the coast of China. Spencer Tracy played Doolittle, and Van Johnson portrayed Lawson. Footage from the film was later used for the opening scenes of Midway, and in the TV miniseries War and Remembrance. The Purple Heart, made in 1944, starring Dana Andrews, was a fictional depiction based on a Japanese war crimes trial of captured American airmen from the Doolittle Raid. The 2001 film, Pearl Harbor, with Alec Baldwin playing Doolittle, presented a heav heavily fictionalized version of the raid. The film utilized a retired World War II aircraft carrier, USS Lexington, in Corpus Christi, Texas, to stand in for a Japanese carrier, while the aircraft were launched from the USS Const Constellation, standing in for the USS Hornet, from which the Doolittle raid was launched. The film's portrayal of the planning of the raid, the air raid itself, and the raid's aftermath is not historically accurate. A VHS video with contemporary footage of Doolittle and the flight preparations, along with the B-25's launching, is DeShazer, the story of missionary sergeant Jake DeShazer of B-25 number 16, the last to launch from the Hornet. The video is based on the amazing story of Sergeant Jacob DeShazer, the Doolittle Raider who turned missionary by C. Hoyt Watson. At the end of both the video and the book, DeShazer, after the war, meets Mitsuo Fujita, the commander and lead pilot of the Pearl Harbor attack. Doolittle Raiders, A Final Toast, a documentary by Tim Gray and the World War II Foundation, was released in 2015 and has interviews with a few surviving members of the raid. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported License, available at www.creativecommons.org.